Hey there, this is MathCamp321, and today I'm going to give you a lesson on the definite integral. The definite integral is used to find the area under a curve. So we're going to read this theorem, and then we're going to put it into practice. The theorem states, if f is continuous and non-negative on the closed interval from a to b, then the area of the region bounded by the graph of f, the x-axis, and the vertical lines x equals a and x equals b can be found by evaluating this thing called a definite integral starting at A and ending at B. And what I'd like you to note first is this correlation between the start point A, the end point B, and these two elements called the upper and lower limits of integration. That start point occurs down here as the lower limit of integration, and the end point B occurs up here as the upper limit of integration. So a definite integral just means the area under a curve. Okay, let's take a look at a specific question. For questions one through four, draw a representative diagram, then use the formulas learned in geometry to evaluate each integral. So in number one, the definite integral is from one to three of the function y equals four. So y equals 4 is just a horizontal line passing through the y-axis at 4. So this would be my function f right here. Now this lower limit here, 1, tells us our start point. And I'm going to draw a vertical line through 1. This upper limit gives us the second vertical line at x equals 3. And then I also use the x-axis as one of the boundaries. So what this definite integral really means is finding the area under this curve f bounded by these vertical lines x equals 1, x equals 3, and the x-axis. So what, what I'm really doing is seeking out this area right here. And it just so happens that this area is a rectangle. So let's write down that it's a rectangle. The area formula for a rectangle is base times height. The base of this rectangle spans from 1 to 3, so its base length is 2. And then, of course, the height of this whole rectangle is 4 for an overall area of 8. So this definite integral represents the area under the curve, y equals 4, starting at 1 and ending at 3, and its area is 8. Moving to example 3, our function is no longer a line, but it is the square root of 4 minus x squared. Now you may remember from a pre-calculus course that this function represents that of a semicircle with radius 2. I'm going to go ahead and draw that semicircle. So this semicircle represents my function f, and I'm starting at negative 2, and I'm ending at positive 2. So I want to find the area under this curve, which is essentially this semicircle. So the area of the circle is pi r squared, but this particular circle is a semicircle, so I need to divide that by 2. So it's going to be pi times 2 squared divided by 2, which is going to be 4 pi over 2, or 2 pi. So the definite integral of the expression, the square root of 4 minus x squared from negative 2 to 2, really represents the area under that semicircle, and the answer is 2 pi. So on this slide, we're making our fundamental connection that a definite integral means the area under a curve. So on slide number two, we're going to be doing exactly the same thing that we did in slide number one, except completely in reverse. This time, they're giving us the geometric representation of the definite integral, and we need to come up with a definite integral which would come up with this geometric representation. So what we see here is that there is a line, or there's a region bounded by a curve, and that curve is this negatively sloped line f, and that's defined for us right here, and that the boundary starts at negative 2, and it ends at 3. And with this information, I'm going to be able to set up a definite integral. The area of this region can be found, and I'm going to start by drawing a definite integral symbol, the lower limit would be negative 2, as indicated by this. The upper limit would be 3, as indicated by this here. 
the function is the line itself, this the f, which is here, and defined for us up there. And I'm going to write that in parentheses because it's a multi-termed expression. And of course, we're going to end with dx. So this definite integral really describes this area right here. Okay, let's move on to example seven. This one's a little bit tougher. What we have here is the geometric representation of the area under a curve. This time the function is called h. So here's the h function. It's defined for us here. So I want to find the area of this curve and I want to use a definite integral in my solution. So I'm going to draw an integral symbol and now I need to consider the lower and upper limits. Now this point here is the origin, so that's zero. That'll be my lower limit. But the upper limit is not given to us. It's a bit of a mystery. But this upper limit is really the x-intercept of the parabola that we're working with. So if we think of the parabola as y equals 2 minus x squared, we can find its x-intercept by allowing y to be zero. Moving negative x squared to the other side, we get x squared equals two, and x equals plus or minus root two. And it would make sense in this case that this is the positive x-intercept. So this is positive root two, and now we know our upper limit of integration. Now, because h is a multi-termed expression, I'm gonna use parentheses, and I'm gonna follow up with a dx. So this definite integral represents the area under the curve starting at zero and ending at root two. So once again, it's another way of connecting this idea that a definite integral means the area under a curve on a very specific interval. Let's go to slide three. On this slide, we're gonna be looking at two special integral properties. The first one says, if x is defined at x equals a, then the definite integral of f from a to a is equal to zero. So this is pretty interesting. Our lower limit is a, and our upper limit is also a. Now usually these values represent the width of the region that we're talking about. But if we're starting and ending at the same point, there is no width at all, which means that the area is gonna end up being zero. So if we ever see a definite integral with the lower and upper limits being the same value, we're going to get an answer of zero. Having said that, let's skip to number eight. It says to find the area under the sine curve from pi to pi. Once again, because these two values are the same, the region that we're looking at will have no width and the area is going to be zero. Let's take a look at the second property. The second property says if x is integrable on closed interval a, b, then the definite integral of f from b to a is equal to the opposite of the definite integral from a to b. What's important to realize in this property is that your lower limit must be a value that's smaller than the upper limit. This needs to be the small number, and this is gonna be the larger of the two numbers. If they ever give it to you out of order, whether it's in a homework problem or on the AP exam, you're allowed to reverse the limits of integration as long as you account for that by putting in a negative. So if we look at number nine, it says, evaluate the definite integral from three to zero of this line y equals x plus two. So what strikes me initially about this problem is that these limits are out of order. It should be small number, large number, and it's backwards. So I can account for that by putting a negative in and then reversing the limits of integration and saying zero to three. So putting this negative symbol in was really important. Now the hint says to use the answer from number two. Well, number two isn't something that we did in this video series. It was something you were supposed to do on your own. So the answer to this question is gonna be the opposite of whatever your answer was to number two. So in summary, on this slide, we talked about two special integral properties, one in which the upper and lower limits were the same and the result was zero, and the other where the lower and upper limits were out of order. It was not from small to large as, as it should be. So we were able to reverse the limits of integration by and putting a negative in to account for that. Let's move on to slide number four.